Hello, welcome to New Harvest Christian Fellowship, Manchester, England, and thank you for subscribing to our sermon podcast. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. We pray it will be a blessing to your life, and if you'd like to get in touch with us, we'll give you our contact information at the end of the recording. Thank you once again. Enjoy the preaching. I'm looking forward to this series. Let me just dispense with these. Praise God, and I need some water. I apologize in advance if I break out into a fit of coughing. Uh, My chest is still a little tight, but we're going to be good tonight. Amen? Amen. Praise God, parables, the secrets of the kingdom. We're going to be looking at quite a few different things from the teaching of Jesus over the next few weeks. So we just want to repeat what Pastor Tom said, really. Try and come to all of them. Try and invite someone out. Who's, who's not normally making it on a Wednesday and say, hey, you're missing out because these are really good. Yeah, I'm getting my advert in ahead of time, praise God. Yeah. Or tell them about the podcast and say, you know what, I know you can't make it, I know you didn't make it out, but hey, you know, whatever reason, you can still listen to all the messages. Go on there, it's free, you don't get anything for free these days. Praise God. We're going to kick off tonight from Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through to 35. So as you prepare that and get ready with that, let's open in prayer this evening. Lord, we just thank you for your presence tonight, Lord God. We thank you that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, you're there in the midst of us, Lord God. Lord, we pray, Lord God, right now that you'd loosen, Lord, your Holy Spirit, Father God, minister through your word to our hearts, bring enlightenment, bring instruction to our lives, Father God. Let us see something of your heart, Father God, as we expose ourselves to these teachings tonight, Lord God. Pray for those who are going to listen again on the podcast, Lord God, that you'd meet them right where they are and bless their lives also. Tonight, we just pray that you'd receive all of the honor, praise, glory, and dominion in this place in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Praise God. I hope you brought a Bible tonight. By way of quick introduction, since I'm doing the first one, um, parables. This is what we're going to study. Jesus taught using parables. And all you Bible study students will know what a parable is. In fact, Jesus is so identified with this style of teaching that in Mark's gospel in uh, chapter 4, verse 34, I think it is, yeah, my writing's really small. The verse there says Jesus didn't teach them anything without using a parable. So this is something we're going to see a lot of. Depending on how you count them up, depending on how you categorize them, I prefer the version that says there's at least 46 parables by Jesus in the New Testament alone. Or another way of looking at it is that's about a third of his recorded teaching output has this format. So this is not some little offshoot of scripture we're looking at here. Jesus majored on teaching through parables. So this is really good for us to look into. We're going to learn a lot. What is a parable? Well, it's a short, simple story intended to impart a deep and probably complex spiritual lesson. So it's a way of making it accessible. These things, these illustrations, these stories Jesus used were probably fictional, but they might have been based loosely around characters and events that people were very familiar with in that time. This was very accessible, street-level teaching. As we'll see, the parable we're going to study tonight, it's really simple, but it's very profound. Why did Jesus use parables? Well, basically because everybody loves a good story. Amen? Everybody does. Stories stick in the mind long after the lecture has finished. If a preacher tells, up, tells a story you know, to the church to illustrate a point, you probably go home remembering that story for weeks. You might even tell your friends and family about the story. You've probably forgotten the title of the sermon. You've probably forgotten the scripture passage. But that story has a way of lodging in your mind. So Jesus used this. Preachers take note. Really good technique. And all parables have a meaning. If you think back to the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8... Jesus told that parable to the crowd and then the disciples came to him afterwards and said, will you explain the parable to us? And as the passage goes on, Jesus did and there was a lot of detail in his explanation. So we should understand that these aren't just little stories that Jesus was chucking out here. He was making some deep, meaningful points and it really repays us spiritually if we study these parables and try and pull out those points and uh, elicit the meaning for ourselves. So in looking at all the parables we're going to look at in the next few weeks, let's focus on what is the meaning 
what is Jesus trying to teach us? And don't just get caught up in the thing of, oh, well, it's some abstract spiritual lesson here that, you know, we can read it in a commentary. No, dispense with that mindset and let's come into church on Wednesday evenings and let's sit down, open our hearts, open our minds and our ears and say, Jesus, what is it that you're trying to teach me? Amen? Make it personal because Jesus can teach all of us stuff through these parables. Some quick aids to doing that, maybe some pegs for you to hang your thoughts on. What's the audience of the parable? Who is this parable being aimed at? That might tell us something about what Jesus is teaching around about. What's the context? What kind of situation was he telling that story in? What prompted him to give that explanation, to teach that parable? And of course, the content. All good stories are about people. Can someone say amen? People are the things we remember in a story. And in fact, it's the people, it's the characters that make the story come alive. You know, if you think you're trying to explain some set of facts and and some amazing things to someone, for example, let's take an example here. The First World War, mechanized warfare on an unimaginable scale, the death toll, the carnage, the, the lives that were shattered, and we can't get our heads around that. But then if someone like Michael Mapogo sits down and writes War Horse, instantly everybody can relate. Even children can open up their minds and their understanding to that thing that's so hard to grasp. Second World War, it's the same thing until somebody gives us a story of Saving Private Ryan. And suddenly we're hanging it on individual people's experiences and we're seeing these events through their eyes. And that's what makes it so, so accessible to us. So... Remember the characters. Who are they? Who might they represent? What did they do? Why did they do what they did? And what was the effect on those around them? What was the result of their choices? Okay, that's just some thoughts. If you didn't catch all that or you didn't make notes, rewind it on the podcast. You can get them later. So let's get into that tonight's parable. Are you ready? All right. Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. Let's uh, cover off those thoughts that we had at the beginning. There's the passage. Who's the audience for this? Jesus is talking to his disciples, okay? And the context, what brought this up? Well, if you read the verses before, you'll see that Peter asked Jesus, how many times must I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? He probably thought he was being really spiritual. And then Jesus told him, no, no, Peter, you don't get it at all. 70 times 7. And then Jesus goes on to teach this parable to explain to Peter why that is the case and why this issue of forgiveness is so, so important in the kingdom of God. So let's walk through this together tonight. It's simple, but it's profound. So if we start off in the first verse there of our passage... Jesus opens up like this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. How many know we're accountable to the king tonight? There's a thought just to open up with. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Wow, talk about opening with a strong punch. Let's break this down and look at some of the things that are happening here. First of all, this ridiculous figure, 10,000 bags of gold. Did anybody bring 10,000 bags of gold with them tonight? No? That's a pity. I was hoping to see at least 10% of that in the offering, Pastor Tom, but never mind. 10,000 bags of gold in the Greek, it's 10,000 talents. For those of you that are mathematically minded, a talent was worth about 20 years of a day laborer's wages. So by my reckoning, this guy owed the king 200,000 years worth of wages. That's a lot of money to be owed. And then with classic understatement, Jesus says, since he was not able to pay, you don't say he wasn't able to pay. He couldn't, even if he would have worked for 200,000 years, he might have been able to pay the debt off. But who lives for 200,000 years? 
This is an utterly unpayable debt here. Literally, this man did not have the means to pay this debt. It was completely beyond his capacity to do. Which raises another question. How on earth did he get into such a mess? How did he end up owing this guy 200,000 years wages? 10,000 bags of gold. Well, it's impossible that this could have been his own resources here. There's only one possible explanation as you begin to think this through. And it hinges around the fact that this guy was a servant. He was a servant of the king. So the money that he must have owed the king must have been the king's money. He, along with all his other servants, was responsible. He was entrusted with the king's business. He was given access to the king's resources to do the king's business and further the king's interests. He was a servant. In other versions, in other places, you'll see the Bible talking about someone similar as a steward. Someone who has authority and uses is responsible for another person's resources. So we begin to see the picture here. This guy did some stupid things with money that was not his. What could it have been? Mismanagement? Possibly. Foolish decisions? Bad investments? Well, maybe. Spending stuff on his own pleasures and comfort instead of putting it out towards his master's business? Maybe. He was a servant, so he had a position. He had some position of some notoriety. And maybe he was giving backhanders and throwing lavish parties and providing entertainment so that other people who were in that business arena would think good of him and begin to, oh, yeah, this is this guy. He always takes care of us when he should have been dealing with his master's business. Basically, what we see here is that the guy was stupid. He made some bad choices. He made some bad decisions. In his own humanity, he got greedy, he got sidetracked, he lost the plot, and he did some stupid things with money that was not his. And now the time of reckoning has arrived. This quickly begins to speak to us, if you think just a little further, of our own condition before God when we mess up. As Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is our case. This is universal. The king here is our master. We are his servants. Amen? That means everything that we have, and indeed the very lives themselves that we live, are not ours. We don't own those things outright. They're given to us in trust by the king, by the master. And we're supposed to do what we should be doing to further his kingdom and his business. We've received everything that we hold and everything that we spend and everything that we use and everything that we put out in trust from our master. We are this servant, if you like, in this life. And when we begin to go and spend the master's goods without any regard for his purposes, his desires, you know, God has given us bodies and health and he's given us senses and he's given us all these different things. And when we begin to spend that capital upon our own pleasures and about furthering our own interests and doing our own thing, committing ourselves and our resources and our strength and our health and our mentality to crazy pipe dreams and the pursuit of pleasures and things like that, instead of being about the master's business, then we run up a huge moral debt very quickly. That because we're just finite human beings with no resources of our own, we cannot pay. We're just like this guy. And this is what it means to be lost. Mr. Sinner, if you're listening to this, this is why you need a savior. Because you do not have the ability to pay this. I call this the moral imperative. By the fact that we're alive, by the fact that we're being created by God, we have a moral responsibility to live our lives for him doesn't say you'll never have any fun, doesn't say you'll never have any pleasure. Man, I'll tell you what, serving God is the best thing I've ever done. It's full of joy, it's excellent. And the thing that makes it good is knowing the boundaries, understanding this one fact, that God gave me everything. As long as I use it in accordance with his will, life is a blowout, amen, it's great. But when we begin to do it our own way, we end up like this guy, messed up, quickly owing a debt that we cannot pay back because we do not have the resources to do so. 
Are you there tonight? Is that you? Are you feeling that in your heart? Well, hang on a minute, because there's some good news coming in the rest of the story. We also see something else here. Because he couldn't pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and everything that he had to be sold to pay the debt. Some people look at that and point the finger at God there and say, you know what, God's being hard-nosed there. That's not very nice. If God really was a God of love, he wouldn't have treated this guy like that. But God's not making a point about, you know, I'm a big bully boy God and I'm going to smoke people who do, who do things wrong. That's not the focus here. If you borrowed 10,000 bags of gold from NatWest or Barclays and you defaulted on that loan, they would come after you. And they would also take everything that you have. They would sell you down the river. They would sell your house. They would repossess your car. They would freeze your bank accounts. If you had any money anywhere, any stocks, any shares, any investments, any property, they would send the bailiffs around and they would clean you out to repay that debt. And none of us would say, oh, if you really were a bank, you wouldn't treat people in such a nasty way. Of course they're a bank. You knew that's exactly what the conditions were before you entered into that transaction. But through your own stupidity, you still got into debt and messed up. We wouldn't blame Nat West or Barclays. Why would we look at God and try and turn that round on him? What Jesus is doing here is basically just telling us straight up, up front, that sin has a consequence. If you do get into this mess, this is what it means. God's telling us here, this is what it means to be lost. This is what it means to be a sinner. Oh, if you just read into this, you get some meat out of this story. Let's move on a little. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Oh, the amazing grace of God. Somebody missed an opportunity to say, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, right there. Because that's the condition that we were in, and that's what God did for us. Woo-hoo! Yes, sir. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Hallelujah. Woo, all those songs coming back. Romans 4, 5, I love this verse. The second part of the verse talks about God who justifies the ungodly. Remember, this man, this servant, was in this mess because of his own stupid fault and his own bad decisions and all of his own human failings with what he did. It was bad choices. It was his fault straight down the line, no question about it, that he got into that mess and yet he received the forgiveness of the king. Yes, sir. He cancelled the debt, Jesus says. That means he declared that it was no longer owed. Isn't that a great thing? That when you stand before God, he no longer considers that you owe that debt that you used to owe. Oh, thank you, Lord. Some of us would have been working for a long time. But listen, if the king declared that the debt was no longer owed, that didn't mean that the debt disappeared. Because to do that, to take that action, the king's affairs, the king's books, were now out of balance by 10,000 bags of gold. What basically happened here was that the king paid the debt himself. You should be going, oh, I begin to see the relevance now. Because the king paid the debt for us himself. Our freedom is not free. It was bought with a very high price. Our king, the king of heaven, paid the debt of sin himself so that you and I could be set free from an unpayable burden that was dragging us down and taking us to a lost eternity. Oh yes, what's some good stuff in here. How quickly we drift back to sin and get into debt again when we forget what it costs to set us free. Stick that one on your fridge. And also we see the conditions here. Don't forget the detail in this story. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. He fell on his knees before him. So here we see that he acknowledged the debt that he owed. He acknowledged it. 
He said, I will pay you back everything. He was saying, it's true. I do owe you this stuff. Be patient with me. I admit that I'm in a place here that I should not be in. That's confession. Forgiveness in Christ, first thing you've got to do is you've got to confess. You've got to agree with God. No more playing games. No more calling sin by another name. No more hiding it behind your back and pretending it's not there. So when you fall on your knees before the Lord and say, Lord, you're right. I'm in a place of debt. I am not in the place I should be, and I owe you something that I can never get right. That's the first ingredient. And the second one, he said, have patience with me, and I will pay you back everything. In other words, even though it's a completely inadequate gesture, he repositioned his life. He said, if I have to work for 200,000 years, I am now going to begin to do the master's business. I'm going to begin to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing that I've been doing for so long that's got me in this mess. And that, friends, is repentance. So here we see the whole gospel in just a few short verses. Wow. So if you need the forgiveness of the king tonight, confession, repentance. Read the passage. It's all right there. Let's move along because I don't want to run over time tonight and there's so much meat in this story. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. This does not look good. After receiving this incredible mercy from the king, the servant goes out and he assaults a fellow servant who owes him, by contrast, a very small debt. Put it in focus here, a hundred denarii in the Greek is what it's talking about. And a denarius was the usual daily wage of a day laborer. So what this guy owed was a hundred days pay. He could basically have worked it off in about three months. So in contrast to the other debt, this one was eminently payable. And here we see the same pattern repeating in the next verse. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. Does that sound familiar? That's just what happened before. Here is a profound point. We've been walking down the path of this parable and we've been stopping occasionally to look at things along the way. Right here, we could break out our stool and set up camp, folks. Here is a really profound point. You think it through, what Jesus is teaching us is this. Listen, all of us owe that debt that the man owed, but another stupendous fact is we will all in turn be owed. We don't just owe the debt to the king. There's going to come times in life when other people are going to owe us. Oh, yes. See what's happening here. Two fellow servants... One had been forgiven this tremendous debt and he goes out and now he finds somebody else that owes him in return. We all owe and we will all be owed at some time or another. And just as that first servant who got into that mess through his own stupidity, through his own humanity, through his own failings, bad choices, bad decisions, thoughtlessness, silly ideas or whatever it was, probably the second servant got into debt with him through equally foolish things. And there's going to be times in our lives when people will owe us. You will be sinned against as well as being a sinner. Things will happen. Things will take place and people will owe you. Whoa, we all owe a debt. And mark my words, we will all at some time or another be owed. Hold that thought because that's very important. Because the thing is, it's not the fact that it's going to happen. It's what you're going to do when it happens. Let's move along and see. But he refused Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. That's actually really stupid. If he wanted the debt paying back, he should have let the guy go to work to pay it off. He's not going to pay it off in the prison, is he? But anyway, people do crazy things when they get angry. But the key phrase here that sticks out is, but he refused. Ooh, 
He refused to show the same mercy that had been shown to him. He refused to treat this man with the compassion and understanding that the king had been prepared to extend to him. He refused to take pity on this man, taking into account his humanity and the foolish decisions and the mistakes that had got him into that position, when that's exactly what the king did for him. He refused to think of the consequences that pursuing this matter was going to have on this fellow servant when the king had mercy on him and spared his family and all that he had. The key here is in the words. He could have done this, but he refused. He was not willing to bend or to accommodate. The issue here is not one of bad circumstances, it's not one of hurt feelings. It's not even an issue of the amount that was owed or the reality of the debt. The issue here is simply one of an obstinate man who would not make a choice. He chose not to do it. And there's another interesting point. Jesus does not judge us by the size of the injuries that we've suffered. He doesn't judge us by the size of the debt. He doesn't judge us by how hurt we feel because of what's happened to us or what's been said to us or what's done to us. The story here says he judges us by our choices, by our response. Now you know why I hammered that point home. We all owe a debt and we will all be owed. And what we do when we come to that place, oh, it's so profoundly important in the eyes of God. Let's move on. When the other servants saw what happened, here it comes, They were outraged, the NIV says. I think that's an understatement. And they went out and told their master everything that had happened. So everybody around this guy can see that he has a very big attitude problem. But he himself cannot see it. You get that? He thinks he's doing the right thing. He's really, he's really stoked that he's been forgiven this huge debt. And now he's going out swaggering like the Hofmeister bear. You remember those adverts? And he's like, oh, now I'm going to claim this debt off this guy. He owes me. And his attitude is so off. And everybody else, every, all the other servants looking at that, and they're going, what's wrong with this guy? This is so wrong. This is so unreasonable. This behavior is terrible. And they were outraged, the Bible says, and they go and tell the king about it. Have you ever been in that place where everybody else can see that there's something very wrong with your attitude, but you think you're cool? Or is it just me? Jesus is telling us here, hey, don't be so block-headed that you don't listen and you're not sensitive to what's going on around you. We can get into that place. Let's face it, folks, you and me can be like this man. It's so easy to get here. Then the master called the servant in. Uh Uh-oh. Folks, there will come a reckoning. There always does. Even things that are hidden in the darkness that we think we've concealed, that we've justified to ourselves, and we've prepared our case as to why we're right, sooner or later, mark my words, God will call us in. He always does. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all the debt, all that he owed. Again, A classic understatement, I think the king is a little ticked off with this man's attitude. And then Jesus really drives the nail home with the last verse of the parable. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. Yeah, it's gone real quiet in here, hasn't it? (laughs) Through this parable, Jesus is beginning to tell us here as we begin to summarize what's going on. He's telling Peter and he's telling us that we have to begin to see 
the sins committed against us in the light of the sins that God has forgiven us for. This is so important. As we have been forgiven, we should also forgive. As we've received understanding and long-suffering and patience, as we've been given the benefit of the doubt, as God has made allowances, as the Bible says he knows our frame, we are but just, but, but dust. And he's just and, and righteous to forgive our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And God has done all these things and these, all these scriptures, so many they're all colliding and falling over in my head at once and I can't get them all out. In the same way, when people wrong us, we have to look at them with the same attitude of mercy and understanding and go, yes, they were foolish. Yes, they made a mistake. Yes, what they did was wrong. But you know what? I'm bigger than that. I have God's grace in my life. God has forgiven me for a tremendous debt. And in his name, I can forgive you also. That's where the power comes from in the kingdom of God. That's the true power of the gospel. That's the thing that people who come against the gospel and against the kingdom of God, as soon as they see that kind of thing being displayed, revival breaks out and skeptics run away screaming. Amen. When Jesus hangs on the cross and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. But so often when people wrong us, we go, oh yeah, but that's what Jesus said. But you knew exactly what you were doing. And now I'm going to make you pay. Amen. It's heavy, isn't it? As Jesus said in Luke 6, 38, with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you again. Let that thought sink in. This is Jesus speaking here. So let's summarize this. There's some points here that we've brought out along the way that I think we should really remember and just revisit so that we lock them in our minds and our hearts. The things, key points that Jesus is teaching us here. For me, this is what they are. First of all, it's the fact that Jesus was talking to the disciples. So this is for church people. This is for all the folk who consider themselves to be disciples of Christ. This is for servants of the king, which is what the people in the story were. In other words, this is us. This is for you and I. This is really relevant tonight to our lives and our corporate existence together as the church of Jesus Christ in this place. Not in some pie-in-the-sky realm somewhere, the church universal, but... In the day-to-day -day dealings when we rub up against one another and sometimes we give one another little bruises and little problems. Amen? Amen. Yeah? Jesus is talking to us right here. He's speaking directly to us. Some people teach this and apply this as a general lesson about forgiveness and being nice to everybody throughout all society. And yes, you can take it that way, and it's applicable. But if you look at the facts of the story Jesus was telling here, he's aiming this right at Christians. Amen? This is for us. We've got to take this to heart. Secondly, remember that point? We all owe a debt, and we will all be owed. Christ in his mercy has taken care of the debt that you owe, but what about the debts that other people do, maybe right now, or will in the future, owe you? Through their own foolishness and through their own bad choices, bad decisions and mistakes, people will owe you. What's going to happen? Jesus said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. <clears throat> Okay, I think the Lord is speaking to us here. He's certainly speaking to me. Some people can blow this off. We can justify why we can't let go of those offenses that have been done to us. This message is for other people perhaps, but it's not for me because I have really good reason to feel the way that I feel. What they did, they did it on purpose. They were, they were uncaring. They, were, they weren't this and they weren't that. and They didn't consider my needs and my feelings and all this stuff. Hey, listen, Jesus wasn't talking about how you feel. He was making a point about how you should act. <laughs> Amen. This is a heavy one, isn't it? But it's the truth. Let that sink in. Remember also, 
Everybody else around could see as plain as day that this servant had a big, big problem, but he himself could not see it. How many times have other people perhaps tried to discuss with you the way that you feel and the attitude prison that you're trapped in regarding some certain circumstance that took place in your life? How many times has it come up in preaching or in a message or in a conversation? Is it possible that once again, having brought it up again tonight, Jesus is trying to speak into your heart and saying, hey, this is an important issue and it's holding you back and it's weighing you down. And if you truly want to be free and you truly want to move forward in the things of God, listen, I'm talking to you about this. Everyone else can see it, but you're going, no, 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 this is not for me. Maybe, maybe, maybe God's trying to do something tonight and take you to a new place. One more thing to think about. All these servants were here supposed to be together serving the king, but this one guy's actions threw the whole thing into complete uproar. All the other servants were outraged. Instead of serving the king, instead of running the castle, instead of dealing with the affairs that they should have been dealing with, they were now all going, have you heard what he did? How it's terrible and everything stopped and everything went berserk. And instead of doing their jobs now, they're having to go to the king and complain about it. It threw the whole thing out of whack. Do you find yourself in a place where you can't serve God because of what someone else said or did? Maybe recently, maybe in the past. Oh yeah, you'll shake their hand, you'll smile at them when you come into church. But every time you do, and every time you have to work with that person, there's that check in your heart. Amen? Well, the truth is, as Jesus is bringing out by that point here, when we get stuck in that place and we refuse to forgive, it hurts the ministry. It hurts the church. It breaks fellowship between brothers and sisters. And that hinders the gospel. It hinders the moving of the Holy Spirit. And the king doesn't like it. So there's a whole realm of reasons there why, if this is you, not condemning you tonight, not saying anything like that, this is just Jesus saying, you know what, this is something that should not be here. And we need to deal with this. Because it will throw the whole household of God into uproar. And no one will be doing what the king is meant, meaning for them to do. Remember, there was all these resources available. This one guy managed to mess up 100,000 bags of gold or whatever it was. All these things that could have been taking place and now they're having to run around getting a bad attitude about this guy because of what he did. And also remember, finally, Jesus tells this story to hammer home to Peter and to us just how critical this issue of forgiveness is in the eyes of God. That's the key here. You see, you can get to a place where you can go, well, you know what, I'm not going to forgive, but I'm not going to act on it. I'm not going to go out, and I'm not going to seize my fellow servant by the throat. I'm not going to do all this stuff. I'm not going dis- to you know, disturb everything. I'm just going to keep that in my heart. I'm just going to retain that grudge. I'm just going to sit here on the sidelines, and I'm going to sulk. Amen? It's possible to do that. But Jesus is bringing it right down here and he's saying, listen, if you do that, you're in sin. Because the king did not like the fact that the servant had that attitude. The king disapproved of it. He said, you wicked servant. So when we get that and we allow that to retain in our hearts instead of dealing with it as Christ says we should deal with it, then we're we're offending the master. And we have to get, we have to come down before God, even if you don't share it with anyone else and say, God, this is in my heart and it should not be there. It displeases you. The parable is clear. I need to get right. So some of us, maybe we need to repent of, you know, unforgiveness for a new issue. And some of us, maybe we need to repent of having one from ages ago that we've refused to repent of. Amen. Whatever. Let it sink in where it may. There's a lot of stuff here. Parable says that the king was angry with the servant. I wonder tonight if any of us here, and, and truly, the king's angry with us, and we need to get it right. So, let's bring this down to a close tonight. Jesus is making some really profound points here. That the way that we treat one another is important. There will always be offenses. There will always be problems, because we're all human. We all owe that debt 
But there's times in life where we will all be owed. And what are we going to do when we find ourselves in that place where we are owed? That makes a massive difference in the eyes of God. Let's close this one for tonight. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Let's let the Holy Spirit minister to us for a few moments in this place. If you've been blessed or challenged by today's preaching and you'd like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is via our website at www.newharvestuk.com. You can email us at info at newharvestuk.com or look us up on Facebook or Twitter. You can call us on 0161 278 6305 or you can even write to us at 194 Chapel Street, Salford, Manchester, M3 6BY. We'd also like to extend a warm welcome for you to join us at any of our services. However you might be feeling and whatever you might have been told, know this. God loves you and there's a place for you in his kingdom. God bless you. We're praying for you. And once again, thank you for listening.